Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. Chris, you know, there's parts of the book of Daniel that can make your head hurt. Yes. Chapter 7 that we looked at last week was definitely one of those parts. And we didn't even cover the whole chapter in depth. No. And that was definitely a chapter that we could have spent another episode or two on, but we're just trying to give the main ideas and the important takeaways from each chapter. So we're going to move on to chapter eight today, but we encourage you as always to dig deeper into chapter seven, and you can always email or message us if you have any questions about it. Definitely. So on to chapter eight today and the need for animal control. <laughs> In one way, chapter eight is a refreshing change from chapter seven, and it will help explain beast number two more from chapter seven. This is one of the rare times where pretty much everyone agrees on what's going on here, probably because the text tells us exactly what the symbols represent. So that's a nice change. A lot easier when it does that. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Before we dive into the text, though, we want to point out that the chapter starts out in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign. So if you've been keeping track, you know that means chapter eight occurs two years after chapter seven, but still before chapters five and six. And we're gonna skip around a little again in this chapter, just like we did with chapter seven, because it just helps make things clearer. Yeah. After stating the time the events in this chapter take place, Daniel tells us that he had a vision while he was in Susa, which is the capital of Persia. He says this in verses three and four. I raised my eyes and saw and behold a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So this is the first part of Daniel's vision. He sees this ram that has two long horns, charges towards the west, the north, and the south. Nobody could stand against him, and he did as he pleased, and he became great. Later in the chapter, and like we said, we're going to skip around, the angel Gabriel interprets a vision for Daniel. After Daniel falls into a deep sleep with his face to the ground, Gabriel tells him, get up so that he can interpret all that he saw for him. In verse 20 of chapter 8, Gabriel tells Daniel, As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. It wasn't a stretch to use a ram to represent the Medo-Persian Empire. Ammianus Marcinellus, a fourth century historian, stated that it was customary for the Persian ruler to wear the head of a ram as he stood at the head of his army, and also that the ram was the national emblem of Persia. A ram was stamped on the Persian coins as well as on the headdress of the Persian emperors. Sounds like the ram is a perfect animal to represent Medo-Persia. Imagine that. God got it perfect. (laughs) Notice the ram Daniel saw charged towards the west, the north, and the south, but not the east. The Medo-Persian kingdom had waged war to win territories to the west, the north, and the south, but it didn't have any conquest to the east pretty cool. Mm -hmm. To quote Adam Clark, he says, the principal theater of their wars, says Calmet, was against the Scythians northward, against the Greeks westward, and against the Egyptians southward, end quote. Okay, on to the next animal that Daniel sees right after the ram, beginning in verse five. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him with his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great. And the vision doesn't stop there, but we're stopped for a minute so we can talk about who this goat that crushes the ram is. Okay, well, Gabriel tells Daniel in verse 21 exactly who the goat was. Came from the west. The west was Greece. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. 
like the ram, the goat was not a strange symbol to use to represent the Greek empire. Again, deferring to Adam Clark, he says, Newton very properly observes that 200 years before the time of Daniel, they, meaning the Greeks, were called the goat people. We want to stop for a second and talk about the timetable of all this. Rose, you mentioned 200 years before Daniel's time, the Greeks were called the goat people. As we saw in chapter 5, Daniel lived to see the Medo-Persian Empire take Babylon and become the dominant world power. However, at the time of this vision to Daniel, the Greek Empire was barely existent and certainly not a power to worry about. The vision Daniel gets is 200 years in his future. It wasn't until the great horn the text mentions, who is Alexander the Great, came to power that Greece became a global superpower. Daniel died around 536 BC, and Alexander the Great conquered the Medo-Persian Empire around 334 BC. So Daniel received a vision that was far in his future, but very far in our past. That's a great point, Chris. The verses you read say the goat with the great horn, who, as you said, is Alexander the Great, was enraged against the ram, who's the Medo-Persian kings. So here we go back to checking out historical records. Alexander the Great was the Greek ruler who was finally able to conquer the Medo-Persian Empire in 334 BC, like you said. Up until then, there were some of the fiercest battles in history between Persia and Greece during what's called the Greco-Persian Wars, which lasted over 50 years, from 499 to 448 BC. So by the time Alexander the Great came to power, he and every other Greek had a big chip on their shoulder about the Medo-Persians. Yeah, and just to give you a brief history lesson on Alexander the Great, he came to power in the Greek Empire in 336 BC. He embarked on a huge military campaign through Asia and Northeast Africa. He created the largest empire of the ancient world at that time by the age of 30. His kingdom spanned from Greece to Northwestern India. Alexander's legacy includes starting Greco-Buddhism, a syncretism between Hellenism and Buddhism, he founded some of the 20 cities that bore his name, most notably Alexandria, which is the capital of Egypt. His resettling Greek colonists into conquered territories resulted in the Greek culture spreading and a new Hellenistic civilization. We see the Hellenist Jews and Israelite Jews go up against each other a few times in the New Testament. Alexander died at the age of 32 in 323 BC. No one knows exactly how he dies. Speculation of causes include typhoid, an alcoholic liver disease, or murder from poison. The important point is that when he dies, he's got no heir. And that is important, not just for the significance it plays in history and the Greek Empire's eventual downfall to Rome, but for the text we're talking about in Daniel. Daniel actually sees this occurrence in his vision. Gabriel says this about Alexander the Great first in verse 8. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. And then if you go down to verse 22, Gabriel says, As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from this nation, but not with his power. Because Alexander had no heir. Upon his death, a struggle for control began. It was eventually divided amongst his four generals into four smaller kingdoms. The kingdoms were named after these generals. There was the kingdom of Cassander, the kingdom of Lysimachus, the kingdom of Seleucus, and the kingdom of Ptolemy. Lysimachus was eventually absorbed into the Seleucid kingdom, while the kingdom of Cassander joined the kingdom of Ptolemy thus leaving Seleucid and Ptolemy as the major players in Greece. And if you know history, you know that these two kingdoms fought for control of each other in what was called the Syrian Wars. One was to the north and one was to the south, with Jerusalem smack dab in the middle of the two. Trouble. Yeah. Yes, it's trouble, trouble is right. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot of time to go into it now, but this greatly affected the Jews in the Promised Land. The war between these two went off and on for over a hundred years. And that's probably one of the reasons Daniel gets this vision to record. But there's definitely another reason, and that is what we see in verse 9. After he sees the great horn on the goat will be divided into four kingdoms. 
So I'll read verses 9 to 11. It says, out of one of them, meaning the four kingdoms, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the hosts and some of the stars, it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. Gabriel gives this further interpretation in verses 23 to 25. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. I think there's a lot of people who are great in their own mind. It never ends well. It doesn't end well. <laughs> so let's talk about this guy. Out of one of the four divided horns sprouts another horn, which starts out small but grows to be a really powerful horn towards what's called in the text the glorious land. Remember we said Jerusalem and promised land are right in the middle of these feuding sides. The glorious land or beautiful land, as some of the translations call it, is the promised land. And this little horn has his sight set on it. So who's this little horn, Chris? Well, from the Seleucid kingdom came a really, really mean dude. This little horn is Antiochus Epiphanes, who reigned from 175 to 164 BC. His original name was Mithridates. He changed it to Antiochus once he took the throne in 175 BC. As a former prisoner of Rome, he started small but began his conquest to take over the Seleucid Empire. His contemporaries called him Antiochus Epimenes, which in Greek means the mad one. <laughs> Tells you a lot. <laughs> yes, it does. The events described beginning in verse 9 happened between 168 and 165 BC when Antiochus tried to unify the kingdom by imposing Greek religion and culture onto the Jewish people. And this is called Hellenization. We saw Alexander the Great starting it by resettling Greeks into conquered areas, but Antiochus Epiphanes forced it on the Jewish people. So let's give a brief history of what Antiochus did to the Jewish people. We got some of this from the Apocrypha in the books of First and Second Maccabees, and some from the historical records of Josephus, who's the most famous and reliable Jewish historian. So we said that Antiochus rose out of the Seleucid Empire, which conquered the other three kingdoms after Alexander the Great divided the Greek Empire into four smaller kingdoms. Took a while, but eventually Seleucid came out on top. Yeah, the Seleucids were not tolerant of Jewish religious practices. They wanted them completely Hellenized. When Antiochus came to power in 175 BC, he insisted the Jews abolish their religious practices and become completely Hellenized. And of course, for the Jews, that would be idolatry. They were persecuted for not complying. Antiochus put his own image on the coins along with Zeus to indicate that he too was a god. He set up a gymnasium next to the temple. May not sound like a big deal, but athletes in those days would compete naked. This was not only seen as a perversion by the Jewish people, but a desecration to be happening so close to the temple. And the ultimate insult? Antiochus forbade worship of God. He abolished Jewish sacrifices and set up an altar to Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, and he sacrificed pigs on it. If you know your history of Jewish, pigs were a no-no. And he murdered the high priest Onanus III. After this, the people revolted, and the Maccabean revolt began, led by Matthias Maccabeus, who was a Jewish priest, and his five sons. And just an interesting note, it was during the Maccabean Revolt that Hanukkah has its origins. Verse 13 of chapter 8 gives us a snapshot of one of the persecutions the Jewish people endured. It says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings. Okay, so this is a little hard to understand. So let's unpack this. 
What Gabriel is saying is that Antiochus will forbid the daily sacrifice the Jews gave to God every morning and every evening. Gabriel said it would last 2,300 evening and mornings. And we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. But first, let's talk about why this is happening. Why would God allow Antiochus to rise up and oppress the Jews, forbidding them from worshiping God, sacrificing to God, and worst of all, allowing Antiochus to desecrate the temple of God? Well, Chris, verse 12 gives the answer. It says, and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offerings because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. And the text isn't super clear here, so let's dig in further. When we line this up with Ezra and Nehemiah, who tell the story of when the captives came back, we see what rebellion the Israelites are guilty of. They were to reinstate the practice set forth back in Exodus of sacrificing a perfect spotless lamb to God in the morning and evening. But instead of perfect, they were bringing the sickest, lamest, and weakest of their flocks. God's telling Daniel in this vision that because of this, he's handing them over to Antiochus. Matthew Henry says this about it. God would not have permitted it if his people had not provoked him to do so. It is by reason of transgression the transgression of Israel, to correct them for that, that Antiochus is employed to give them all this trouble. The great transgression of the Jews after captivity, when they were cured of idolatry, was a contempt and profanation of the holy things, snuffing at the service of God, bringing the torn and the lame for sacrifice, as if the table of the Lord were a contemptible thing. And therefore, God sent Antiochus to take away the daily sacrifice and cast down the place of his sanctuary. So harsh punishment, deservedly, but harsh. Mm -hmm. And the punishment was going to last 2,300 evenings and mornings. So there's two ways this can be interpreted. First, there were two sacrifices per day, morning and evening. So if this is 2,300 half days, that would be 1,150 full days, which is just over three years, which is a reference to the years 168 to 165 BC, when persecution by Antiochus was at its worst. The second interpretation is that it's talking about 2,300 full days. That would translate into just over six years and would be the period between 171 to 165 BC. That was the period of persecution by Antiochus, but also includes when Antiochus killed Onesus III in 171 BC. Onesus was the last high priest. He was killed because he refused to sell out to Antiochus and refused to be his puppet. So whether the 2300 mornings and evenings is three years or six years, the temple was desecrated during that whole time. Right. But either way, as always, God does not leave his people without hope. Gabriel tells Daniel that the sanctuary would be restored. And in verse 25, he says, he shall be broken, but by no human hand. This first reiterates the sovereignty of God that we've been talking about. Just as it was God's sovereignty that gave Antiochus dominion over God's people, so it would be God's sovereignty that will take him out. Antiochus and every other evil ruler will be destroyed, but it will be by the hand of God and in the timing of God. How did God do it in case of Antiochus, Rose? Well, even though it should have never been, the Maccabean revolt that we talked about was eventually successful. And of course, that's because the hand of God was in it. According to the scroll of Antiochus, when Antiochus heard that his army had been defeated in Judea, he boarded a ship and fled to the coastal cities to the east. He was defeated there, and he drowned himself in the sea. Remember, the angel told Daniel that Antiochus would die, but not by any human hand. And that is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So after Antiochus died, the Seleucid kingdom began to crumble and was defeated by Julius Caesar, as we saw last week. Rome was more tolerant of the Jewish people practicing their religion and the temple was purified and put back together. It seems odd that after Rome being the worst beast in chapter 7, the Greek Empire is the focus in chapter 8, also in chapters 10 through 12, which we're going to see. That's why some people think the Greece is the fourth and worst beast, 
But the biblical evidence definitely lends itself to Greece being beast number three and Rome being beast number four. So why is Greece singled out in four chapters? It's because the persecution to the Jewish people by the Greek empire was so intense. And like we said, while Rome was bad, they did let the Jewish people practice their faith. But there's more. First, as we looked at last week, the definition of Antichrist. Antiochus definitely fits the definition of an Antichrist. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And further, the Greek Empire had an enormous impact on biblical history in the New Testament. The Hellenization that went on during the Greek Empire's reign precipitated a major cultural change. For one, during this time, 72 Jewish scholars translated the whole Old Testament into Greek. That's what the Septuagint is, if you ever heard of that. Also, changing from being written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. And while that might not seem like a big deal, it was. And this is so cool to see what God does through this. Because while it seemed like the Greeks had the upper hand oppressing and dominating the Jewish people, they were doing exactly what God needed them to do. By Hellenizing the surrounding areas, including making Greek the main language, God was preparing the world for Jesus. The use of the Greek language enabled the sharing of the gospel from India to Spain. Along those same lines, Greek philosophy gave us the concept of the Logos doctrine. It refers to rational divine intelligence. The early Greek philosophical tradition known as Stoicism held that every human participates in a universal and divinely ordained community, then used Logos doctrine as a principle for human law and morality. The Stoics believed that to achieve freedom, happiness, and meaning, one should attune oneself to the wisdom of God's will. John ran with this concept as a way to explain the nature of Christ in his gospel. If you recall John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, which is the Greek word logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is similar to what Paul did when he used the, the inscription to an unknown God to help explain the gospel and turn people to Jesus. Also, the town of Antioch became the launching point for Paul's missionary journeys, where the disciples were called Christians according to Acts 11.26. So as you can see, there are lots of reasons that the Greek empire is singled out in Daniel. Right. And all of it is just so cool and mind-blowing. We were, had our minds blown last time, and here they are again being blown. Okay, back to Daniel and some takeaways for us. We gave you a lot of history today. So let's get some takeaways. Both chapters seven and eight are filled with disturbing images. You know, it would be easy to get spooked by them and a lot of people have been. Others have made lots of money sensationalizing it all and making God's word look like a Marvel comic book. However, what we need to keep in mind is that the beast's reign, even future to us prophecy, I'd like the fourth beast that we talked about last week, no matter how terrifying, is not the end of the story. You know, there's a famous sermon entitled Sunday's Coming, and its message is simple, but it's profound, and it's applicable to all of us at any given time in our life. It might feel like Good Friday right now. You know, things were dark on Good Friday. There was no more hope. The only sign of hope had been killed. And we might feel like that sometimes. We might feel like the apostles wanting to hide in a locked room and never come out. We might feel like we've gotten it all wrong and maybe God isn't working for our good. Maybe he's not even around. But friends, Chris, after Good Friday comes Easter Sunday. Amen. Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday wiped out all of the fears and hopelessness of Good Friday. It showed that God had always had every circumstance well in his hand and was using everything to accomplish his plan and always had our good in mind. Never were we out of his thoughts. Easter Sunday's coming means that none of us who are God's people ever have to feel hopeless or scared or discouraged ever, even when it seems like evil is winning. It's not. God is just allowing it to rain briefly to further his plan. This was the message of Daniel chapters 7 and 8, and it's the message for us today. It's the message of this whole book because Jesus the mountain fills the whole <laughs> earth eventually from That's way right. back in chapter 1. Even when it seems as if Friday will never end, take heart because Sunday is coming. And I can't think of a better note to end on. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, 
If you haven't already, please help us out by leaving a rating and a review for this podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. And if you have read the Bible Blueprint and found it helpful, please leave a review for it on Amazon. We would greatly appreciate it. We would. Have a blessed day, everybody. 